Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, I'd like to, you to welcome all of you to today's webinar. I'd especially like to welcome um, Ann Christensen, who's the Director of International Climate Policy with the Center for American Progress, and Blanca Bernal, who's the Senior Technical Expert with Green Collar. Anne is going to be presenting today, and uh, Blanca is going, who is also um, co-author on the paper they wrote together, um, will be helping with questions at the end. So um, I wanted to let everyone know um, how the webinar will run. We'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation, and then we'll move on to a Q&A period. Um, we'd welcome all of your questions whenever you think of them. You can send them in in two ways. You can put them in the question panel, um, and then that's a little bit easier for us to handle in terms of questions um, for asking the presenter at the end. Um, or you can put things in the chat. Now you can put questions and comments and resources. Um, with the chat, you can make it visible to everyone. And if you have things to share that would be our on topic, we encourage you to use the chat. Um, but we just ask that you keep it on topic and professional in the chat since it is visible to everyone. Um, so today's webinar is going to be about strengthening blue carbon solutions in U.S. policy, and I will go ahead and turn it over to Anne now. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us today. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Anne Christensen. I'm the Director of International Climate Policy at the Center for American Progress, which is a multi-issue think tank in Washington, D.C., um, my presentation today is based on two articles that I published last year. The first was in Frontiers Marine Sciences with a global set of co-authors, including Blanca, who is joining me. Um, and it was called The Promise of Blue Carbon Climate Solutions, where the science supports ocean climate policy. And in this article, we quantified and compared blue carbon stocks and discussed policy vehicles and gaps to support blue carbon. I also published a column for American Progress last May that discussed where the U.S. can step up on blue carbon. Since then, a lot of new policies have been implemented and proposed, within the US, so I'm really excited to discuss them here today and then also where the US can go next. Oops, there we go. So blue carbon is having a bit of a moment. Uh, until recently, the ocean was considered both a casualty of climate change in terms of losses associated with ocean acidification and marine heat waves. It was also considered a climate threat to humans from sea level rise and extreme weather and in some rare instances, it was kind of considered a, this benevolent protector of humanity in terms of the role that the ocean plays in atmospheric regulation and heat absorption. But the ocean is also gaining attention for its mitigation potential. And folks here may have seen or may have written one of the many headlines over the last few years stating that blue carbon is a climate solution. It was this word solution that was the impetus to the paper that I led last year, where we sought to put blue carbon into this larger policy and climate intervention context. So there are really three questions I hope to partly answer here today. The first is how much of a solution blue carbon actually is for the climate crisis. The second one is how do types of blue carbon stocks really stack up against each other in terms of their climate benefits? And the third is what types of policies can be put in place to support blue carbon initiatives, somewhat in the international context, just um, to give that more global framework, but also particularly for the US. So the first part of our agenda here, we're gonna talk about the scale of the, car the climate crisis. Then I'm gonna go into defining blue carbon and quantifying sources of carbon, um, and then talking about international blue carbon policies, US blue carbon policies, and what's next. We have a fairly large audience today, so I assume not everyone here is both fluent in the science of blue carbon as well as the climate policy, but I hope I can at least hold your attention during the parts of the presentation you may be a little bit more familiar with. Um, but I do assume that people attending have a basic understanding of climate change and knowledge of its impacts. I have some resources afterwards if you want to get caught up on a bit of that. 
And then also for much of the first part of the presentation, I'll be going into the results of the Frontiers paper that we published last year. Um, however, I did not write the sections of the paper that dealt with the quantifying the sources of carbon. So that is why I've asked uh, Blanca, who is one of my co-authors to join me today in case folks have some more technical questions on the calculations that she can help answer. So first off, I think we need to put the scale of the climate crisis into context. Um, it really is truly a massive, massive problem that we are facing. We need immediate, rapid, and significant cuts to greenhouse gas emissions now. I have to say upfront and very clearly that without emissions reduction, there is no way that we can adapt, restore carbon capture and store, or geoengineer our way out of this crisis. Uh, the world needs to be phasing out the extraction, production, and consumption of fossil fuels in the next three decades, with an at least 43 percent emissions reduction by 2030, which as a reminder is only seven years away at this point. The time frame as well that we have to reduce emissions to secure a 1.5 degree warming target that was agreed to under the Paris Agreement is also rapidly diminishing. Our actions in the next five years will determine if we are able to reach that goal. More than likely at this point, we are going to be in an overshoot scenario where we go above 1.5 degrees and then hopefully draw down carbon to get back to uh, 1.5, which is deemed a more livable uh, temperature, and how much we will exceed that and for what time frame. So there are currently multiple policy and market mechanisms that have been created or repurposed to address climate change, which I'm sure many people here are very familiar with. It is though pretty grim picture. Most of these are falling far short of what is necessary to meet those goals that I laid out in the last slide. So first off, for domestic emissions reductions, they really lag behind globally. There is some progress being made in a handful of the major emitting countries, and those are the countries I'd really like to focus on as they uh, emit the vast majority of emissions, both historically and currently. So the U.S., first up, um, last year passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which despite its name is a climate change bill. Uh, it is an at least $369 billion investment. I say at least because a lot of the policies in the bill are opt-in policies. And so the actual scale of the investment may exceed actually $1 trillion. Um, so these climate programs have been modeled in, within the bill, have been modeled to reduce emissions by 3.3 to 4.6 million metric tons per year, or reaching this 31 to 51% reduction below 2005 levels, by the year 2035. I know it's a lot of numbers in there, but it's a good thing on the whole. Um, China has just reached 51% electricity generation capacity from renewables, which is a huge, a huge gain and milestone for them. However, it has China has also just approved 86 gigawatts of new coal-fired capacity, and it has turned back to coal as drought conditions from climate change have cut hydropower generation. The EU has also cut emissions by 30% compared to its 1990 levels, but to, in order to reach its 2030 goals, it needs to cut a further 132 megatons of CO2 equivalent per year. So moving from the domestic to kind of these international frameworks, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is what the Paris Agreement came out of, commits countries to take domestic actions that will limit total global warming to 1.5 degrees. Currently, we are at a 1.5 degree, 1.1 degree world, sorry. Um, the nationally determined contributions within the Paris Agreement, these are the plans set out by each country detailing their domestic emissions plans. If you put those all together, they put us on a path to 2.4 degrees of warning. So you can see that there is a lot of space there between 1.5 and 2.4. 2.4 is clearly an unlivable world. Um, and so we really need to have much more ambitious targets under these NDCs. There are also carbon markets that are designed to create incentives for emissions reductions. These have fallen short across the board due to lack of regulations, unstable carbon pricing signals, and lack of oversight. There is climate finance. You may have heard about this in the news, especially within the last few years. Um, this is really a tool to aid developing nations and emerging economies to help reduce their emissions, to implement adaptation programs, and to build renewable energy infrastructure. Uh, the current levels of climate finance are what seen as really inadequate. Developed countries pledged $100 billion per year in climate finance. None of this is yet, or they have yet to reach that goal per year. 
uh, even with that 100 billion per year, that would be insufficient. An estimated 3.4 trillion per year is needed for mitigation financing globally. The adaptation finance gap is currently at 173 billion per year and loss and damage, which you may have seen in the news recently, especially as it was um, part of the landmark agreement in the last conference of parties in Sharm el-Sheikh last fall, um, or in last November, loss and damage from climate change is predicted to cost between 290 and 580 billion per year by 2030. So that is different from adaptation. This is actually what is being lost um, within communities, within nations that they need to replace. It is not adaptation. Um, the private sector also is key to solving the climate crisis, both in terms of reducing its own emissions from key industries like steel, cement, transportation, electricity, shipping, and aviation, but as well as financing mitigation and adaptation. However, we have yet to see any initiative that truly unlocks this private sector financing um, or you know, cracks the code of public-private partnerships at the scale that is needed, in particular for adaptation. Lastly, conservation is a key part of any climate conversation as well um, through nature-based solutions in particular. They can be used in both in terms of avoid emissions and carbon storage for restored ecosystems, as well as potential of ecosystem-based adaptation. Uh, yet, despite some promising new frameworks like the Global Biodiversity Framework agreed upon at the Convention on Biological Diversity last December and the new UN High Seas Treaty, which was agreed to in March, but um, awaiting ratification right now. We all know that, you know, habitats continue to degrade, pollution is increasing, there's currently one million plant and animal species threatened with extinction, three quarters of all the land environment and two thirds of ocean environment have been altered by humans. So a pretty dire picture there as well. So given the state of this problem and the clear need to use all of the climate tools at our disposal and the ones that we may not yet have developed, what exactly is blue carbon and how does it fit into this picture? So in our paper, we define blue carbon as the biologically, deri biologically driven carbon fluxes and storage in marine systems that are amenable to management. The US in its Ocean Climate Action Plan defines blue carbon very simply as coastal and marine habitats that naturally store carbon. So I wanna um, make sure to differentiate here between blue carbon and ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. So the latter is deliberate efforts to increase atmospheric CO2 taken up by the ocean through interventions like iron fertilization and alkalinity enhancement. So as the policies, interventions, and regulations for OCDR versus blue carbon methods are very different, it's important to distinguish between these two and I will not be going into OCDR in depth in this presentation. I also want to define additionality, which is a concept that is so important to this conversation and one that people may not be familiar with. Um, and this is also a really crucial concept to answer the question of how much of the solution is blue carbon, how much of a solution is blue carbon to the climate crisis. So additionality is the measure of how much blue carbon exists beyond um, what existed before because of changes in management or policy intervention. This concept is critical to policy because it relies, because policy relies on the measurement and verification of carbon to quote, get credit um, for these interventions, whether that be credit for the carbon market or for countries to be reaching their climate goals. Um, it's also important to understand this concept to be able to identify greenwashing, which can distract resources, time, and financing away from other climate interventions that are more impactful. So now turning to the quantification of blue carbon. As a brief refresher, ocean stores carbon in four primary pools, dissolved inorganic carbon, organic carbon, marine biota, and the sediment floor. So through the solubility pump, the ocean physically uptakes atmospheric CO2 and chemically converts it into dissolved inorganic carbon that is transported into the deep ocean via mixing and currents. You can see from the figure, which you can find in more detail in our paper, that dissolved inorganic carbon is the largest carbon stock in the ocean. As part of the natural pre-industrial carbon cycle, um, this pump was in equilibrium with the atmosphere. However, anthropogenic emissions, so greenhouse gas emissions, beginning in the industrial period have modified this equilibrium. The pump has provided a buffer to climate change, absorbing 25% of all human-induced carbon emissions over the last 150 years, though the effect in, effectiveness of this ocean sink will decrease with increasing cumulative CO2 emissions. 
The ocean also absorbs carbon through the biological pump in which phytoplankton photosynthesize, um, photosynthesis transforms CO2 into organic matter that is then exported from the surface waters into the deep ocean where it can be stored for the periods of time long enough that it would have a significant contribution um, to a carbon stock. You can see from the figure where dissolved organic carbon falls in compared to inorganic, where the blue carbon stocks I will review in the next slides are far smaller to the left on this logarithmic scale. It's the biological pump which we will be focusing on today as this process underpins the sequestration potential of these blue carbon stocks. So moving on to quantification. First up is mangrove salt marshes and seagrass beds. These together are referred to as coastal ecosystems and are widely recognized for their ability to sequester carbon in, bio in biomass and especially in soils. However, when we look at sequestration again with additionality, the net additional emissions reductions can only be achieved through avoiding coastal ecosystem degradation and destruction. And right now these coastal ecosystems are under threat around the world and a very small percentage of the original ecosystems are still in existence. Um, in addition to the carbon sequestration benefits of mangrove salt marshes and seagrasses, they provide significant adaptation services, such as buffering coastal storms, mitigating floods, protecting against accelerated sea level rise, and supporting coastal water quality and food security. Kelp is a slightly different story, even though I put it on the slide. Uh, it's potentially an important carbon stock, but the carbon is stored in biomass rather than soil, and much of it, because they are uh, a rooted not um, like the forests of the mangroves. Um, and the carbon can be exported away from the site of orientation, which creates challenges for policymakers. You also may have heard a lot about organisms such as krill, big fish, and whales that have a role in the biological pump through the fertilizing effect on phytoplankton, um, while their diurnal migrations, fecal pellets, and dead carcasses can also add to the downward vertical pump of carbon in the ocean. The sequestration potential of these mobile species is a lot more difficult to quantify. As you can see, some of the data we have is a little bit disjointed. Um, much of the data, particularly on fish and whales, attempts to quantify their contribution to blue carbon in the absence of fishing or at pre-whaling or post-restoration levels. So conservation efforts that seek to maintain or moderately increase populations really don't contribute any additionality to global carbon stores. Also, the time scales and uncertainties for population recovery, which is, of course, further threatened by climate change and overfishing, complicates the calculation of the additional carbon sequestration that could be attributed to these species. Shelf sediments also represent a significant carbon stock. However, additionality here too complicates their inclusion in blue carbon policies as humans would need to increase these carbon stocks to claim additionality. However, human actions such as deep sea mining and trawling can disturb shelf sediments on a large scale and risk disturbing these stocks and releasing CO2. Therefore, protecting these um, considered avoided emissions. Polar regions, which are close to my heart because I worked on Antarctica conservation for some time, have a peculiar blue carbon uh, stock right now. It's, as sea ice and glaciers recede, um, there are a lot more of these shallow areas opening up where phytoplankton can bloom, which in turn enhances the benthic biomass within polar regions. So ironically, the blue carbon in these regions is actually increasing because of climate change. So with that data in hand, we can turn to the policies that support blue carbon interventions. I want to quickly touch on the global level, but spend the bulk of the time focusing on U.S. policies. So first, a brief overview of the challenges to blue carbon accounting, which I talked a little bit about in the past slides, but which really underpin what is possible for any blue carbon policy. These range from the difficulty to measure, monitor, and manage for carbon sequestration to changes in human behavior, which may undermine these sequestration goals. We can think about um, blue carbon policies in several ways. Those that have mitigation goals, those with marketable carbon goals, and those with adaptation goals. For the first two, the concept, again, of additionality is really, really important. To hold countries accountable to their climate commitments, accurate accounting of carbon stored in blue carbon systems is necessary. Um, for market-based goals, those familiar with the challenges associated with carbon markets know that double counting and greenwashing can undermine carbon markets 
and ultimately these can fail to contribute to the climate crisis. Um, and lastly, for publicly financed adaptation, the measurement and verification aspect of the carbon itself is not as critical, but the social implication of interventions must be explored to ensure that the benefits of habitats that store blue carbon are being equitably distributed and tangible to the communities who rely upon these habitats and who live in the area. So really the reality, and if there's just a few things to take away from this presentation, this is one of them. The reality that underpins all climate policies is that we are working with finite capacity, finite expertise, finite funding, and finite political capital. So with these limited resources, where can we deploy them most effectively to really make actual climate gains? Uh, internationally, there are several frameworks where blue carbon comes into play, and I've talked about a few already. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time going over these, but there are extensive advocacy in these areas, extensive literature, a lot of research, so I really encourage everyone to explore those if they're interested. Um, briefly, the UNFCCC Paris Agreement, uh, blue carbon stocks can be included in national emissions reduction plans. As of May 2022, 45 countries mentioned the protection, management, and restoration of coastal marine ecosystems to meet both their mitigation and adaptation climate objectives. Um, there are other international frameworks which prioritize marine protected areas as a vehicle, and they can be used as a vehicle for blue carbon protections as well. The recent Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework enshrined the protection, the principle of protecting 30% of land and waters by 2030. CAMLAR, which is the multilateral governing body of the Southern Ocean, has committed to creating a network of marine protected areas. However, unfortunately, opposition from the delegations from China and Russia have stymied, stymied these efforts. And then the recently agreed to High Sea Treaty also notes that the creation of MPAs as one of its objectives. Blue carbon markets, as I mentioned, are another mechanism that can incentivize protection, conservation, and restoration of blue carbon systems. Um, where these projects can generate credits that can then be sold on the market to offset emissions um, elsewhere. One recent paper from this year estimated that the blue carbon credit demand could exceed $10 billion. Excuse me. Uh, domestically, the U.S. has been actively creating new policies to connect ocean conservation and climate action. I want to highlight a few new federal efforts that can enhance domestic blue carbon stores while providing the social environmental co-benefits of these ecosystems. Um, one of the important things to note here is that while there are numerous policies that can enhance blue carbon, blue carbon primarily through coastal ecosystem protection and restoration, the policies are often framed as coastal resilience initiatives. So you've got to do a little bit of digging uh, to find them. Um, but first off, President Biden passed a number of executive orders which direct federal agencies to take climate and conservation actions. In particular, Executive Order 14008, released in his first week in office, directs a whole of government approach to climate action from climate security to clean energy infrastructure. And it was this EO that really laid out the president's vision for how he will tackle climate domestically and internationally over his first term in office. Um, the EO specifically mentions the need to protect coastal ecosystems for resilience, sequestration, biodiversity, and fisheries. And the EO also led to the creation of the National Climate Task Force, and they created then the Coastal Resilience Interagency Working Group, which is tasked with meeting public needs around storms, flooding, and other coastal climate impacts, and that includes blue carbon as well. I also wanted to highlight the America the Beautiful initiative which is President Biden's call to action to conserve, connect, and restore 30% of lands and waters by 2030. Retaining coastal blue carbon is a priority within this initiative. And earlier this year, the administration put forward a call for proposals for landscape level conservation and restoration projects under America the Beautiful. And then at the heart of all of these programs and initiatives, the ones I named here and many that are unnamed, is the administration's stated commitment to environmental justice. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, and then I will discuss the Ocean Climate Action Plan in more detail as well. So I wanted to speak directly to Justice 40 um, because it really is a groundbreaking executive order that seeks to address the legacy of systematic environmental racism that has existed in the United States since its founding. 
As many people know, um, but also many people don't, Black, Latino, and Indigenous communities are currently and have historically been exposed to higher level of pollutants in the United States due to disproportionate siting of these sources um, near their communities. And these include things like refinement facilities, power plants, transportation hubs, incinerators, and industrial facilities. All of these pollutants from one or multiple sources can lead to cumulative impacts um, and acute and both long-term health problems. At the same time, this is compounded by discriminatory federal housing policies like redlining that have discouraged lending and investments in communities of color, and that has in turn concentrated poverty and severely curtailed the ability of families within these communities to pass along generational wealth. So Justice 40 sets out the goal of having 40% of overall investments of certain federal dollars go to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. Existing federal investments for climate, clean energy, transit, affordable housing, workforce development, and clean water must meet this threshold. So although people think often that environmental justice is just an urban issue, it is extremely present in rural areas and coastal areas as well. Um, here, of course, talking about coastal areas where frontline communities are often facing disproportionate climate impacts alongside displacement from development, aging infrastructure, and lost fishing resources, as well as the sources of pollution I mentioned earlier. So programs covered by Justice 40 can help address this discrepancy in coastal resilience and restoration efforts. Nature-based solutions are often undertaken in rich coastal communities who have the resources and time to first identify the federal dollars, but then also bring forth the local matching requirements that a lot of federal resilience grants require. Disadvantaged communities, though, often have a greater need than these rich communities. They're more likely to be located in flood zones, they are least protected by flood insurance, and they often have lost access to sources of income from coastal natural resources. So with that background, a key piece, like how do we move forward? How do we ensure that these communities are first identified as Justice 40 communities and then are given the support that they deserve. Um, a key piece of this puzzle is the process um, of actually mapping out where these communities are. The White House Council on Environmental Quality launched its Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, which identifies disadvantaged communities on the census track level, so very small level, if they meet one of the tools categories of burden and an associated economic indicator, or they are on lands of federally recognized tribes. So burden indicators in this data set um, are related to things like climate risks, legacy pollution, and housing, among other factors. I really uh, encourage you all to explore this data as this initiative can be a powerful tool in ensuring that the co-benefits of these blue carbon resources and interventions we are talking about can reach frontline communities. Environmental justice principles are also one of the cross-cutting priorities of the Ocean Climate Action Plan, which was released in March of this year. The three main goals of the plan are to create a carbon neutral future, which is through things like offshore wind, ocean um, carbon dioxide removal, and green shipping, to accelerate nature-based solutions, and then also to enhance community resilience to ocean change through things like climate-ready fisheries and coastal resilience. Uh, blue carbon is included in the OCAP as a key way to accelerate nature-based solutions, primarily through two opportunities, protection, conservation, restoration, management of blue carbon habitats, and utilizing these habitats for co-benefits. Within these two opportunities, the OCAP really lays out seven near-term actions, which I have grouped here. So the first are actions which are broadly centered on protection and conservation of blue carbon habitats. These are um, places that recognize the multiple ways blue carbon habitats are under threat, seek to protect, conserve, and restore systems through federal actions. They prioritize working with state, tribal, and territorial governments and building capacity through providing technical system assistance. Um, they recognize that not only do we need to prioritize conservation of blue carbon benefits, but to protect current habitats to avoid potential emissions, both from complete habitat loss and also degradation. But it also notes that carbon potential of restored systems is not as clear as intact systems. So really prioritizing this preservation rather than restoration. Second, there are actions based on expanding research into blue carbon. 
to be used for identifying, mapping, monitoring, and enhancing the benefits of these systems. These encompass coastal ecosystems, but also explore the potential of other systems like kelp, macroalgae, and offshore sediments. Lastly, the OCAP identifies the development of standards for carbon uh, management to improve both accounting tools and also measure the health and resilience of the ecosystems themselves. So not only is this administrative, um, not only are there administration aspects or actions that are incorporating protection of blue carbon systems, but Congress is also increasingly active in this space. Back in 2009, uh, under the American Recovery and Investment Act, there was a you know, relatively small for the federal government amount of money for uh, coastal restoration. Um, in this administration, significant funding has gone towards coastal restoration, in particular through the IIJA and the IRA. So the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is also um, called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or BIL, authorized over $1 trillion in infrastructure investments, and this included over $500 billion in new programs. In April, $477 million, so those are overall numbers for infrastructure in the United States, but within that, $477 million was announced for coastal communities, including projects that store carbon and restore habitats. In the Inflation Reduction Act, which I mentioned before, this was the Democrats' landmark climate bill that includes $369 billion in climate investments. Within that, we have um, $2 billion for coastal resilience projects, and this includes $400 million specifically for tribal priorities, nature-based solutions, and investments for weather and climate data and research, and also support for the America the Beautiful initiative. Uh, in Congress two years ago, Representative Suzanne Bonamici and Representative Bill Posey led a bipartisan House letter calling for another $10 billion in coastal restoration and resilience projects, noting that the return on this investment is several fold. Um, there are also several current bills in Congress, about a half dozen or so, that direct agencies to undertake coastal habitat preservation, conservation, and restoration. The CREST Act is written to provide for advancements in carbon removal research, quantification, and commercialization. And the Coastal Habitat Conservation Act, which actually had hearings both in the House and the Senate this week, directs the Department of Interior to support efforts to assess, protect, restore, and enhance coastal landscapes. I'm not endorsing either of these bills listed here, but I just wanted to mention them as signaling momentum on this issue in Congress. So what is next for US policy domestically? Clearly blue carbon is seen by the current administration and some members of Congress as a worthwhile avenue for ocean climate action. There is of course more to be done and avenues for the US to broaden the benefits of blue carbon ecosystems. First, the U.S. needs to embrace adaptation benefits of coastal ecosystems more fully. I know we're talking about blue carbon here in the, in the mitigation sense, but it is really the co-benefits of these ecosystems that have an outsized role in climate action. And they have bipartisan support in Congress, which is also beneficial. Uh, the U.S. needs to elevate adaptation goals generally across agencies and offices and support behavioral science at the root of understanding of how to get community buy-in for coastal restoration and maintenance. And then also they need to create a comprehensive adaptation strategy for the country with coastal ecosystems as a key part, both, both for the mitigation adaptation benefits of blue carbon systems, um, but also um, to, to enhance the current policies. The Biden administration should also prioritize Justice 40 communities for coastal restoration dollars in the IIJA and IRA and waive any matching fund requirements. Uh, investment should also prioritize blue carbon and community engagement efforts, and the federal government should expand the technical assistance it provides to state, territorial, local, and tribal governments with a particular focus on disadvantaged communities, including support for planning and for accessing and interpreting data. Also, there needs to be more support for mapping current and potential blue carbon stores that can enable communities and others to better preserve and restore blue carbon ecosystems and invest in new carbon enterprises to ensure um, that community engagement and the tools are reaching those in need there should be clear points of contact and outreach um, but i want to also note here that with the rapidly closing window for significant climate mitigation also the continued shortfalls of climate financing a near-term focus on enhancing current validated blue carbon ecosystems is likely justified in particular as preservation and conservation is more cost-effective than restoration. 
Of course, additional research funding is always needed and appreciated uh, to explore better, to better explore and understand um, and maximize sequestration potential of blue carbon stocks, to streamline monitoring measurement and verification systems, and to help set up standards that limit greenwashing. The U.S. can also enhance its internationally facing policies that support the expansion of blue carbon stocks around the world. So I'm just going to focus here on the U.S. policies rather than the specific recommendations within multilateral flora and carbon markets. Again, there's extensive literature and advocacy being done right now, for example, um, through the UNFCCC Ocean and Climate Dialogue. So really encourage you to go out and do some research on that and talk to the folks who are working in that space. Um, first, the U.S. Um, blue carbon stocks are currently not included in the U.S. Prepare Action Plan. This is the U.S.'s um, plan for adaptation around the world. So given the numerous co-benefits of these systems, that coastal areas are home to an estimated 40% of the world's population, uh, really we need stronger engagement and understanding within agencies that implement PREPARE, such as USAID. The U.S. can also support other countries in incorporating blue carbon into their national greenhouse gas inventories and nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. It really takes a significant amount of time and resources and expertise to measure, map, and monitor blue carbon stocks. This is an expertise that um, few governments are able to support within their federal operations as well as their university system. So many of these countries, including some with the most significant coastal wetlands under threat, need this added capacity to include their systems in their mitigation plans. Uh, they can also include blue carbon ecosystem co-benefits into their national adaptation plans. Lastly, as I've talked about numerous times, the risk of double counting carbon in areas beyond national jurisdiction, such as the high seas and in the Southern Ocean, are really high and current multilateral frameworks do not address the potential for blue carbon in these regions to be monetized. So the US should really take steps to better understand blue carbon stocks in these regions, but also utilize the current policy mechanisms to protect against double coning and greenwashing that are um, a real risk for blue carbon in these regions. So in conclusion, I wanna revisit the questions I posed at the start. First, how much of the solution of uh, how much of a solution is blue carbon to the climate crisis? I would characterize it more as a tool of an all of the above strategy. One of the main points I hope folks take away from this presentation is that the co-benefits gained from blue carbon policies that target mitigation may be actually more impactful for the resources that we're devoting to them than the carbon stored itself. There may be federal policies that can enable blue carbon habitats to be managed in a way that enhances these co-benefits and those should be emphasized. How do blue carbon stocks stack up against others in terms of climate benefits? Uh, what is clear from the science is that coastal ecosystems are the most advanced and demonstrate the highest sequestration potential and crucially are the easiest to manage of these systems and they should be prioritized. More research is needed on shelf sediments, kelp and macroalgae, and mobile sources like fish and whales are unlikely to prevent uh, to provide additionality, particularly at pre-restoration levels. Lastly, what types of policies can be put in place to support blue carbon initiatives, both internationally and in the U.S.? So, as I've made clear, international fora exist to elevate blue carbon, but the finance, research, and additional caution is needed. In the U.S., the Biden administration has embraced blue carbon, integrating it into a number of executive actions. Congress uh, is increasingly valuing coastal ecosystems for their resilience gains. And the once in a generation infrastructure bill and the landmark Inflation Reduction Act have injected billions of dollars into nature-based solutions with millions going to blue carbon. So I really encourage folks who have joined us today to look into these no programs, take advantage of this window of opportunity uh, and really maximize these blue carbon policies in the US. Happy to share my resources and references for anyone um, who reaches out. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining today. And I really look forward to answering questions alongside my colleague, Blanca. OK, thank you so much, Anne. Um, and thank you for doing this work to both you and Blanca. We really appreciate having these things laid out because um, there's little snippets here and there. But seeing it all together is really impactful. Um, so. 
I just wanted to remind everyone you can ask questions either through the chat or the Q&A. The Q&A is a little easier to share for the read, but uh, chat can be seen by all the audience members and is a good venue for uh, if there are relevant resources you want to share um, or if you wanted broader input. Um, so we'll get started. There were a couple questions early in the webinar. Just if you could talk more your thoughts about greenwashing and blue washing. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for using the term blue washing, because I think, um, Blanc, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we use that in the paper. Um, but this is, so this occurs when um, countries, private entities, uh, other individuals use something like blue carbon um, as a way to convince folks to use their product, as a way to get more investment um, in a certain intervention they are doing. Um, but it's really not uh, creating the climate benefits or the conservation benefits that they're claiming. So for example, um, something that immediately comes to mind is I've seen a lot of uh, comparisons of, oh, well, the, the benthic carbon in the Southern Ocean is worth X millions of dollars. Well, if folks go in to start monetizing um, that benthic carbon, but that's not actually additional to carbon stores, this can direct funding, resources, research money away from where it's actually needed. It also happens a lot in carbon markets where um, you may see, uh, for a terrestrial example, you may see uh, forests um, being replanted, but for a single with a single species or with a non-native species. And so, yes, carbon is being stored, but it is not in a way that's actually benefiting and providing additional co-benefits and additionality in that carbon storage. I know Blanca, if you have anything else to add to that. No, I think that was good. Thanks, Anne. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question, how does abating sewage and wastewater pollution in the ocean, including MPAs and other conservation restoration efforts, factor into blue carbon storage policies? Um, and another way of putting this, how can blue carbon be a viable storage solution if sewage and wastewater pollution isn't eliminated from coastal ecosystems? I don't Blanc, if you want to tackle that one first. Sure. Um... Yeah, no, this is an important point. I mean, definitely a pollution can be uh, a driver for coastal wetland degradation and loss or carbon, blue carbon ecosystem degradation and loss. Um, I would say the first thing that you should do when you are looking into the carbon benefits of a project that is going to restore or, or preserve the carbon stocks in a coastal wetland is to look for what is driving that degradation and loss. Is it people collecting part of biomass or is it pollution? And that definitely has to be addressed if you want to either avoid the continued loss or, or increase the carbon stocks through, through restoration. Um, that, that would be my main comment. I, I don't know if you have something else to add. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Could you please provide your perception about other initiatives promoted under the blue carbon label? For example, artificial ocean fertilization, induced upwelling, et cetera. Yeah, I can take this first. Um, you know, that those are really classified as ocean-based carbon dioxide removal interventions. And there, I think right now, a lot of the conversations that I've been having um, within the community, within the NGO community, but also with folks uh, in Congress and in the administration is the need to really clarify and communicate the differences between these nature-based solutions, which most people who work in this space are considering blue carbon solutions, and then these separate, um, more direct interventions that have to do with actually altering the chemistry of the ocean. So that's, you know, the iron fertilization and, and other interventions that I mentioned. Um, and so I'd say that those two that this person um, has pointed out fall more along the lines of these OCDR, these ocean or also marine based carbon dioxide removal methods. Um, my impression of them is that much more research is needed. Um, there's, there are federal dollars, significant federal dollars that are going towards um, both lab-based but in-situ in situ, um, 
experiments to see how these types of interventions, these types of mitigation interventions are altering biological components of the ocean, are altering um, some of the feedback systems that we have. And what we're really at risk for right now is having these lone actors, um, whether they be companies or literally just people going out there alone and getting funding and doing their own experiments in the ocean um, that could have wide ranging impacts. We really need to speed up our understanding of how all of these systems work. We need to speed up um, federally regulated experiments that can provide the baselines for what should or should not be done. We need to be talking to communities who again will be on the front lines and the most affected if these experiments go wrong. Uh, and then we also need a code of conduct, which um, folks uh, in the community are currently creating right now that can provide a basis for um, how experiments and how OCDR can be done um, in a safe way that actually provides this additionality, um, because it is going to be done. No matter what, there are going to be lone actors, there are going to be companies, they've already started to do these experiments and do these projects. Um, both on the high seas, but also in, in national waters. And so we really need to have more research to be able to um, do them safely and effectively. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, I also wanted to call attention to one that uh, Blanca answered, but just call attention to the question and response. Um, but the question was, how are practitioners uniformly measuring the carbon sequestration resulting from implementation of natural and nature-based strategies? For example, tidal wetlands restoration. Uh, and Blanca responded that voluntary carbon market, uh, such as VERA, has peer-reviewed standard methodologies publicly available for robust and consistent tidal wetland and seagrass conservation and restoration carbon measuring and monitoring. So I wanted to make sure everyone had uh, seen that. Um, then there was another question. Um, uh, first, thanks for a great presentation. Um, some new seaweed products have potential to sequester carbon and or result in avoided greenhouse gas emissions at a profit, but many are not yet being made at commercial scale. Are there opportunities within existing US policy to foster the development and scaling of such products? Um, I would, I, th I think the answer is yes, but I, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that really there's a morass of policies and, um, and different programs and funding, especially because of this multi-billion dollar influx, um, that we are seeing into the space. So I can't give a definitive yes and point you into the right direction, but, um, I believe that there are either grants or matching grants that um, are available to scale up those types of projects. Okay, and if anybody um, knows of any specifically, uh, we'd welcome you to put them in the chat and make those available to everyone. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a question, um, what would you consider the top three best carbon offset um, credit platforms? Um, I, I get this question a lot and I don't, I honestly have a lot of hesitation to say that any are very good at all. Um, I think that there is a lot of, um, issues around these platforms. Um, there's not a standard verification method. It's really hard to ensure that the carbon credits are being used um, ethically and that they're actually providing uh, climate gains. And so, I mean, in my position, I would never endorse or, or say any were the best. And I would caution their use generally. I don't know, Blanca, if you have a different experience with them. Um, no, I guess I would say that in general, you have to keep a good eye on how robust is the the estimate of um, sequestration versus emission of the activities that are being described or taking place and, and see how well they are validated and verified by independent uh, experts. Okay, all right. Thank you guys. It's great to have your perspective on this as we deal with this in our daily lives. So they're professional ones. 
Um, we have a question. How is farmed seaweed and active sinking being considered discussed? Um, for example, startup company sinking sargassum in the, what's this GOM, and I'm assuming that's Gulf of Mexico. Blanca, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would say in, in general, these uh, initiatives um, that aim to bury organic matter in the in the sea floor and stuff. Um, there's many that are uh, looking into these kinds of things and they fall into the the pool of activities that Anne was mentioning earlier of uh, ocean carbon sequestration. There are not it's not necessarily a natural process but something that is that requires energy investment and and a clear balance of what is uh, a, a positive sequestration, a, an actual sequestration or an actual reduction of, of net emissions when you do this activity. Um, and so because many many of them are going to depend on how they are planned and designed and such, um, each one would require a, a specific evaluation. This one in particular that you mentioned, I I haven't looked into that one, but, but in general, I think it's important to think when you're burying, when you're investing energy and burying uh, organic matter from from the surface algae into the deep ocean, there is um, for sure a, a greenhouse gas emission that is going to be emitted in the process just because you need energy to do that. And then another unknown is going to be all the ecological impact that that whole process is going to have. Um, overall, I think this, this topic needs much research, but so far the general consensus of these activities is that they don't seem to be a clear um, net sequestration. But again, uh, the, the field is evolving and, and we definitely need to know more. Again, I'd also thank you for that, Blanca. Um, a, per usual, much more eloquent uh, response to, to these types of experience. Um, I want to underscore again the point that I made in the presentation of putting these types of interventions comparing them to each other. So one of the things that we have um, in our paper is a, a figure that shows the emissions from a single coal fire plant and how that stacks up against every blue carbon source in the world. And it does, and blue carbon doesn't come out on top. So you really have to think about like all of the energy, all of the resources, all the investment that can go into solving the climate crisis, where at this point in time, when we have about five years to make incredible gains, where should that money investment time, um, literally inches on the New York Times front page, where should that be going? All of the resources that we have at our disposal. So when folks are, are reading about these types of interventions, um, I really suggest to putting them into perspective of, of the scale of the problem. Um, that's a great perspective for us to bear in mind. I also need to offer everyone an apology. Um, Zoom has changed one of the settings since I last used it for a webinar, and I realized the chat was not enabled for all of you. Um, there are some resources people have posted in the Q&A, which um, would be great to have in the chat. Um, for everyone to see. So you, I've just enabled it and you can go ahead and um, post that now for everyone to see. So my apologies for not, I didn't, that is a different setting than I'm used to. Um, so another question uh, that's come up, um, well, there's so many good ones. Um, are on incorporating blue carbon into Arctic policy, what do you see as the most tangible on-ramps for doing this? Do you see it happening within policy discussions around particular sectors or within governance channels or some other fora? Yeah, I would see this mostly in, um, in two ways. One is through the Arctic Council. Um, the Arctic Council is a pretty fraught space right now. Russia, most, so the, to back up for a second, the Arctic differs from the Antarctic. The Antarctic is, a global commons, um, Southern Ocean, the areas around Antarctica, whereas the Arctic, um, the entire Arctic is uh, partitioned between um, exclusive economic zones of countries that border um, the Arctic. So Russia, as you may imagine, has a huge border along the Antarctic. So much of the Arctic area is, um, is within Russia's exclusive economic zone. As one may imagine right now, 
with the way geopolitics are um, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, their tensions within the Antarctic Council are, are pretty high. So for an on-ramp currently, I don't see that happening um, just because a lot of stuff is um, gummed up there. But in terms of, of where it can go in governments wise, um, it can be because it is exclusive economic zones, um, any additional um, blue carbon that is protected there. So we're looking at more at avoided emissions from trawling and such things uh, that can be included um, in the, the um, emission reductions plans within countries. Um, but also there is potential for there to be uh, policies created within the Arctic Council around blue carbon um, as we see you know, more ice being freed up and more blue carbon um, uh, in benthic systems in the Arctic region. If you're talking about other parts of um, carbon or climate mitigation in the Arctic, such as shipping and, um, and other things as sea lanes open up, that's a, that's a separate conversation. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, a new question, what in general do you perceive as the optimal method for valuing blue carbon in parentheses, carbon markets in such a way that maximizes carbon benefits and co-benefits. Do any specific examples come to mind of instances where it is succeeding or do you think the efforts are too immature to assess? Um, I, I can, you can say something yeah. here, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of, um, benefits going back to the communities, it all depends on who is the standard that you, in the, in the voluntary carbon market, who is the standard that you're working with? Um, and I'm, I'm just going to focus on the voluntary market system. Um, the other national policies and stuff would be different depending on country to country. But on the blue carbon market, there are certain requirements of meeting safeguard criteria um, in, in the, both in the VCS and the Plan B standards, um, and, and sorry, and also in the gold standards. So all of them have that kind of criteria. Then the main focus, the, the importance of that focus that the standard gives varies from changes from standard to standard. And for example, the Plan B standard is very focused on generating benefits through carbon projects that go back to the to the communities that are, that live in the ecosystem. That is. That is what they, what the standard takes proud, pride on. Um, in terms of which one is better, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say, but um, but you can do that kind of comparison when looking at different um, carbon standards and the the protocols and the methodologies that are approved um, through them, because that would be the reference for the type of projects that are going to register and generate credits under that standard, and they are the ones that are going to meet those criteria. Okay, thank you, Blanca. Um, then there's a question, if not through carbon markets, what do you think is necessary to encourage private investment in blue carbon initiatives? I'll take a quick stab at this, Blanca, but um, then I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um, I saw this question pop up and I'm like, dang, that's a real good question. Um, again, if there was a silver bullet to this, um, I would hope that it had been found yet unlocking private investment has been really difficult in terms of um, climate change writ large. Like even, even the massive industry overhauls that we are seeing, it's really hard to unlock this private investment without uh, public dollars first. The thing that I initially thought of um, that may be an avenue for this is um, through insurance. Um, there have been some interesting new programs that use nature-based solutions as a way to um, reduce insurance premiums. And um, there's actually been some insuring of coastal ecosystems. And so that could be um, a creative way to get more private capital um, interested in private entities interested in blue carbon. Uh, Blanca, over to you. Uh, well, like it's, I would say like, like it said, about climate change, the best way to 
to raise awareness is to talk about it. So I think to talk about blue carbon and the importance of this ecosystem, the value that they have, not just as a significant carbon storage and and as a way to naturally capture carbon from the atmosphere, but also about the multiple co-benefits that they provide to the local communities and to the communities that are not local because we all depend on fisheries and on clean water to essentially to survive. Um, I would say raising awareness is the first step. Um, granted, there is more research that is needed. Um, uh, there are areas in the world that are vastly understudied and others that are very well studied in this field. So knowing more is always going to be uh, necessary, but um, but yeah, I think raising awareness and, 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 and making people and companies realize that this is worth investing and the benefits are multiple and they can stack. It's not just carbon, it's, it's communities and it's biodiversity. It's perhaps a good way to, to start. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Anne and Blanca, for being here today and presenting and answering questions. There were still some questions we weren't able to get to, unfortunately, um, but I'll, I can provide uh, um, information on what those were uh, after the webinar. And um, also for everyone who is interested, if you're interested in getting a list of the resources from Anne's presentation, as well as the resources that were shared in the chat, um, you can shoot me an email um, my email is associated with the webinar itself, so you can reply to that. It'll, it'll get to me um, and I can send it to you. And um, thank you again so much, so much for being here and presenting on this. And thank you to everyone who participated and shared information and asked great questions. So we hope to see everybody on a future webinar for more information sharing. Great, thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for joining. Yeah. Okay, and thank you so much, Anne and Blanca. We appreciate all this. Thank you.